Hi, welcome to the next of our series on mini lectures. It's going to be a fairly short one today. And again, what we're talking about is creating a laser. This is the second half or two thirds of the course and is really what this course is all about. How do lasers work? How can we build them? How can we design them? And again, the element we're going to be talking about of the laser, and we show all the different elements of the laser right here, is the cavity. Um, and specifically what we're starting to cover is beam formation in a cavity because we know that, that we can make a cavity that's stable and trap light rays inside there, but the ray description of light is really very limited and, and has all kinds of problems with how laser beams really work. We know that beams propagate because we've already covered this um, as Gaussian beams. So we want to know what does a Gaussian beam formed by a cavity look like or what's the beam inside the cavity going to look like so we can predict what the beam looks like as it leaves the laser for any type of engineering we want to do. And so again, the two elements that we have here is a cavity, which we assume to be stable. None of what we're going to talk about makes sense for an unstable cavity. And we know that if we have a source inside here, that light rays may be trapped by this cavity and form some kind of thing that looks like a Gaussian beam. And we want to say, what does the Gaussian beam really look like? And there are two ways to do it. They're sort of solving some equations uh, using algebraic methods, and there's more of a computational uh, approach that's much more general that we'll cover in the next mini lecture, and we're going to do sort of the algebraic approach today. And this is actually fairly simple. Um, so the first realization we need to have um, if we want to talk about creating a beam inside a cavity is that the light that bounces back and forth inside this cavity is going to have to do this very many times because typically in a laser, in order for the laser to work, uh, you have reflectivities of these mirrors of at least 90% or above. There are certainly exceptions as there are with everything in the world, but, but this is generally true. And so the light's going to be going back and forth between these mirrors very, very many times. And what this means is that the radius of curvature of the beam has to match that of the mirrors after a round trip. Because if you have light that goes through, bounces off a mirror, comes back, and the radius of curvature is different each time it comes. It doesn't match the mirror because the mirror is the only thing that essentially is a fixed radius of curvature in the system. But if the light doesn't match the radius of curvature, the phase fronts of the wave won't match up. And this is what happens if the phase fronts do match up as you go through one, two, three, four times. Um, the total field inside the cavity from all these reflections is going to add in phase, and you're going to get a big field, have a, a large amplitude, right? Some large value of amplitude E of your electric field. But if they don't match up, if the phase is different for multiple repetitions, um, we know that, that the waves are going to be out of phase, and the total electric field here is going to be smaller. And if we have one, two, three, four repetitions, the total field here is going to be basically the proportional to the square root of four, because remember from our discussions way back at the beginning of the semester for incoherent sources, they add up as the square root of the number of sources. While here, in this case, the total amplitude is going to sum up proportional to the number of sources, and the field size will be 4. And the more we add, say we have um, 100 repetitions through here, the field size will be 100 for the waves that add up in phase, and only 10 for the waves that don't. So what does this mean in short? The mirrors of the cavity force the beam to align to them, because they fix the phase relationships of the beam. And so I'm going to pop that up here, and let's look at this. The light phase fronts are forced to match the mirrors. From an engineering point of view, you engineer the beam by choosing the mirrors rather than choosing mirrors to match the beam. And so this is the first of our design constraints for a laser. We can create any type of Gaussian beam inside the cavity by picking the radius of curvature of these mirrors. Remember, so we have some radius of curvature. We'll call R1 for mirror 1 and another radius of curvature R2 for mirror 2. We pick those radii of curvature to, to create the beam we want. So how does this work? Well, we know that we can calculate the radius of curvature of a beam at any point in the cavity. And we know
know that 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 gives us essentially the waist size at any point in the cavity. And for certain special cases, uh, this is very straightforward. We know if one of our cavity mirrors, uh, R1, has a radius of curvature of infinity, which means it's a flat mirror as shown in the picture, that that's where the beam waist has to be, because at a beam waist, the radius of curvature is infinity. At z equals zero, this term goes to infinity, and we know the radius of curvature is equal to infinity. So we know essentially where to put the beam waist in this special case of a flat mirror for one of our mirrors. And if our mirrors are spaced a distance d apart here, so that, that the cavity is stable, uh, we can just go ahead and substitute d for z into this equation. And uh, from this, knowing that r of d, the distance is r2, because z equals 0 is defined to be at the waist, and we know where the waist is, uh, we can just solve the simple algebraic equation to, to get the parameters of the Gaussian beam created by this cavity. And in this special case, it's fairly easy to do. And this is done in the first part of chapter 5 of your book. In a more general case, where we have radii of curvature that are finite values, R1 and R2, um, we would know where the waste was in the special case that R1 equal R2, because then we put the the waist z equals z, or right in the center between those two mirrors from a symmetry argument. But in the general case that r1 is not equal to r2, um, it becomes a rather tedious um, process of algebra to go back and to substitute the known values into the Gaussian beam equations again here and here and solve that for the waist position and I'm not going to write the equations down here because you can look this up in your book. But again, these are covered in the first part of Chapter 5 of your textbook. And so for the two cases of a flat mirror and a curved mirror, or two arbitrary curved mirrors, uh, Verdian gives you what the solutions are. For more complicated cavities, ones with multiple mirrors or other elements inside, for example, if we stuck a block of glass that looked like this inside our cavity, uh, we would have a much more complicated case, and in that case, we'd have to use a more general and numeric rather than analytic procedure, because in this case, the equations would get rather ridiculous to solve. And that's what we're going to talk about in the next mini-lecture. And thankfully, with the advent of computers, this is a fairly straightforward process, but we'll leave it here for today.